So what are we gonna talk about today? Uh, let's see. Well, you know, right here's kind of an index. We're gonna touch on some of these areas. Now, I will tell you right up front, there's, you know, the, the subject of cybersecurity is this wide, that deep, and that long. I mean, there are so many things that we can cover. So I'm just gonna skim across the top. Hopefully this will uh, whet the appetite of uh, many of the uh, many of you in the class who have a desire, uh, as I've been reading uh, your aspirations within the class, to to move forward in cybersecurity. So I'm just going to kind of share some of these things, but this is by no means all inclusive. Okay. So when we talk about cybersecurity today, we're going to talk about uh, cyber and risk. Uh, look at some of these cyber attack vectors. We're going to talk about the attack kill chain and look at some of the the, the domains, uh, different certifications, and some of the different um, jobs that you can do within the the realm of cybersecurity. You know, I love this uh, this little pictorial. You know, of the the person you know falling for the for the scam. You know, we think that cybersecurity crimes is something new. It isn't because man have been taking advantage of man for years. And really all cyber has done is provided new tools, that's all. But the concept of, of getting something for nothing or trying to exploit someone uh, for, for their property, for their goods, has been around for a long time. As a matter of fact, all the way back to Genesis, Genesis chapter six, this is a scripture that resonates uh, every time I read it. And this is in Genesis chapter 16 when God is looking at, at man, not long uh, after creation and before the flood. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. So you see, the heart of man has all it's ever since Adam's state of falling, you know, it's always been there. So this whole thing with cybersecurity really isn't anything new. Now we're just looking at different ways, different tactics, different techniques to um, combat something that's been around since the beginning of time. But now when we talk about cybersecurity, really what we're talking about is risk management. It really is it risk because everything we do is risk. Uh, so when we look at risk, I, here's the definition. Here's the definition for risk, okay? Risk is the likelihood of a threat agent taking advantage of a vulnerability and the corresponding business impact. So what risk does, risk ties together vulnerability, threat, and the likelihood of, of exploitation. It, tie, it brings all those together and that's risk. We deal with risk every day in life, every day in life. Any of, all of us who probably own a vehicle, we own a car, we own a home, we deal with risk. And because that's why we have insurance. That's why we do take certain precautions. That's why we lock our doors or close the windows or put in security alarms because we want to reduce the likelihood of a threat agent, someone, someone or something that will do damage and harm uh, to take advantage of a vulnerability. We all have vulnerabilities. You're your car is vulnerable every day that you put on the highway. There's vulnerabilities. So what we try to do is reduce those vulnerabilities. Same thing we do in, this, in the world of cyber is dealing with risk. Okay, so let's take a, a look at these each, each word, each of these pieces of this risk model a little closer. So when we say what, what vulnerability from a, from a cyber perspective, access a software, a hardware, some type of weakness that can provide an attack or the opportunity to obtain uh, unauthorized access. Thing to remember, there are always vulnerabilities. You will never get rid of a vulnerability. Vulnerabilities will always be in your network. You can always be vulnerable to something, just like your home. You will never get rid of all the vulnerabilities in your home. There's always gonna be an access, a way that someone, if they want to, with enough energy and with enough effort to break into your house or to break into your car. So vulnerabilities are gonna always exist. Now we gotta look at the threat. What is a threat? A threat is a natural or a man-made event that can cause some type of negative impact. Like I say, so actually it could be weather, it could be, um, like I say, man-made, um, uh, power failure. All of these things are threats that can cause some type, that can have some type of negative impact. So now when we say a threat agent, <clears throat> what that is, that's an actual person or an entity that takes advantage of a vulnerability. So we got a vulnerability and we have threat. Now, what happens when threat meets vulnerability? What happens when those two come together? Well, it depends. It depends on how much exposure we have. Now, what is exposure? Like I said, that's an instance of being exposed to losses from a threat agent. So let me give you an example. Uh, let's say my home. I leave my window open when I go on vacation. Okay, that's a vulnerability, right? Yes. Um, now, are there threats? It depends. If I live on the 12th floor of, an, of a high-rise apartment, 
now that lessens quite a bit. I have less exposure. If I live on the ground floor, I have more exposure. So, or my uh, threat vector is bigger. My surface threat, you know, the surface attack surface has gotten much bigger. So now the threat gets greater. And now, especially depends on if my window is facing out toward an, an open street or an open alley where there's many people who, who walks by. But now what is the, what is the likelihood that a threat agent is actually going to come through that window? Well, that's the, the risk that I have to be able to to mitigate. And I do that with some type of countermeasure. And that's what a countermeasure is. That's a way of mitigating or lowering risk. And in the cybersecurity world, we call these controls. If you work in cyber, you're going to hear this word all the time, controls. What type of controls do we have in place to mitigate risk? And when we say mitigate risk, there's many ways of doing that. Like if you think about risk, there's about four or five things we, we can do with risk. Um, we can accept risk, meaning that I'm just going to hope that it never happens. I'm just going to accept the risk. Um, we can um, <clears throat> mitigate risk well, by doing things to, to uh, for instance, let me, I'm going to park my car in my carport when the when it looks uh, like it may have we may have a hailstorm. I'm trying to mitigate that risk. Um, I can uh, actually get rid of risk. Let's say with your car, if you sell your car, you have just removed the risk of it getting damaged by a hailstorm. We can also transfer risk. That's why you have insurance. What you've done, you've transferred your, the risk, like your car, to Geico, USAA, Allstate, you know, State Farm, whoever you have insurance with. So that is how we handle risk. Uh, and, and in the cybersecurity world, we have controls that we put in place. And they could be physical controls, they could be administrative controls, or they could be technical controls that we put in place to help mitigate the risk of some type of activity or the likelihood of a threat agent exploiting a vulnerability. Now, why I like the reason I like doing this is because it helps us to not only become better at what we do as cyber, but also if you're new to cyber and you're looking at uh, your resume and you're looking at, well, I want to get a job, the, this is the language. This helps you speak. This is the lexicon so that when you're ta speaking cyber, you're talking threats, you're talking vulnerabilities, you talk exposure, you talk controls, countermeasures, and those types of things. So, <clears throat> another thing that we always like to discuss when we talk about cyber is some of the core cyber principles or concepts. Now, there's three things that we do. We call this a CIA triad. Uh, when we think about cybersecurity, there's three things that we're always trying to do. And everything in cyber comes back to these three competencies, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So when we talk about confidentiality, and this is from an information perspective and from a hardware network software perspective, confidentiality is a principle that we want our information and our data not to be disclosed to unauthorized uh, subjects or unauthorized personnel. And we do that typically by encryption. That's why we, uh, we, we use encryption, is to ensure that information that we have remains confidential. We think about integrity. Just like the word says, we want to be sure that our information hasn't changed, it's trustworthy, and it hasn't been intentionally modified by someone who isn't authorized to modify it. So we want to ensure that the integrity of our information is good. We have other concepts that we use that we call like hash and, and things like that that we use to be sure that, that from the time that we create information to the time that it's used, that it hasn't been uh, changed uh, in, in, a, in a bad way, in a nefarious way. And the third availability is that we want to be sure that our information systems are available so that when I need to get to my data, when I need to get to information, that it's available to do that. So those are some of the core principles. Now, also, when we talk about information, we always want to talk about information access control, because at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to protect, not just our network. And that's why we also kind of move away from network security to cybersecurity, because cybersecurity is a lot more encompassing. I'm trying to do more than just protect a network. It's the information that that network uh, that transverses or that's stored uh, on that network, that's important. So there's about, there's, uh, and, uh, this model here is what we look at <clears throat> for information access control. And it's a process, it's I and five, five A's. Identification, authentication, authorization, access control, and auditing. Now, I love using this analogy because we, we do this in life all the time. And if someone comes to your door, knocks on your door, what is the first thing you're going to do? You want identification. Who is it? You may look out the peephole and say, okay, I, I either recognize him and I, I know who he is. Or if I don't, then you're going to ask for identification. And you're going to also, you want proof that that, that identification is who it is. So you're going to authenticate that identification. That's the process of confirming that the identity of the user is who it is. That's what we do every time we go into a network. Uh, let's say you're, you're uh, when you logged into Blackboard, 
Well, you provided identification with a username. You typed in your student ID. Now you typed in a password. The username provided identification. The password provided authentication that the owner of this user name is also the owner of the password. And now the database, the backend database, allows you to get into the network. So you've been authenticated. So now that you're authenticated, you are able to move freely around the network? No, you're not. You're only uh, authorized to move around the network to go to places that you are authorized to go to. That's what authorization, that's what authorization is, the process of determining what rights and privileges that you have when you're on the network. Meaning that as a student, you're authorized to go to this location, to these shared files, to these places. Whereas maybe as an instructor, there are more places that I can attend, I can go to on the network because I have different authorizations. So now let's say that even though both of us can have authorization to go to a share drive, just because we're authorized, that means we have access to everything on that share drive. For instance, I could have some files on there that I'm using discretionary access control. So that way I can I have discretion on who has access to those files. Access control, so that's determine uh, what resources you can get to. So going back to that analogy that of your house, let's say I came to your house, you checked my identity, good, you authenticated it, now you authorize me to come in the door. So I walk into the door, I've never been to your house before, you let me in and I instantly wanna go to your bedroom or, or you know, to some private part of your house. You're gonna go, nope. You're not authorized. The only place you're authorized to go is the living room and you can use the hall bathroom. So now I'm in the living room. Okay, great. I'm authorized to be here. You gave me authorization. But now I want to pick up your remote control and start changing channels on your um, you know, $8,000 stereo system, uh, entertainment system you got. Well, guess what you do? You smack my hand and look at me like I'm crazy because I don't have access to those to your personal devices there. Or let's say if your wallet is laying, is out there or your purse, I don't have access. Even though it's in the room and I'm authorized to be in the room, I don't have access. So the same thing happens here. Now also the other thing that we do in our networks to ensure information control is auditing. Now that's what I do a lot of at the, at the place I work now, where we audit and we look at everywhere you've gone uh, within the realm of where you had access. And also look at, did you try to get to somewhere that you didn't have access to? So that's auditing. And we look at logs and files and things of that nature. So we had, I talked about our core principles, CIA, confidentiality, integrity, availability, and information access control, identification, authentication, authorization, access control, and auditing. So let's look at some cyber attacks because now we, we know how it's set up to <clears throat> keep our information uh, demarcated and safe, but there's always nefarious players out there who wanna get to it. So when we think about attacks, we have about four different categories. Actually, and here again, this is very loose. This is not uh, written in stone because I mean, there's so many ways that you can slice and dice this thing with attacks. This is just four ways that, I, that I'm, I, I like to look at them. End user device attacks, reconnaissance attacks, access attacks, and DOS or denial of service attacks. All right, so when we talk about end user attacks, we're talking about worms, viruses, Trojans, um, things of that nature. Reconnaissance attacks, are that's where we're trying to get uh, 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 people trying to get information about your network, trying to get intel, intelligence information, uh, discovery information, or trying to see what type of vulnerabilities you may have. That's like people working on a case in your house, you know, that, that, that thief who, hmm, yeah, I might be able to break into that one. Uh, access attacks, i say these are exploits or that uh, <clears throat> try to gain access to your accounts, to databases, to sensitive information. They're trying to gain access. And then denial of service attacks, which is trying to, trying to um, keep trying to kill availability. You go back to our CIA. So now denial of service, uh, DOS attacks, is just trying to uh, make it so that you cannot get to the information that you need to get to. So let's talk about each one of these. So when we talk about um, some end user attacks, like say viruses, worms, and Trojan. And so there's a fundamental difference between a virus and a worm even though sometimes we like to throw them in the same bucket, they're really not the same. And it's very similar to uh, uh, in the natural. If we have a virus, there's something that a virus has to have, uh, like the flu virus or you know whatever virus goes around each, each winter. Um, it has to have a host. Whereas a worm is, is a self-contained 
code. It's executable. Whereas a virus has to attach to something else. So the same thing. You actually, a virus is what? Malicious software that is attached to another program uh, to execute a particular unwanted function. Whereas a worm, arbitrary code, and this installs and copies itself in the infected computer. Now, a little history lesson. One of the first worms, or the Morris worm, was created in 1988 by a Cornell grad student. And what his, according to him, it was not done for malicious reasons. He was trying to measure the size of the internet at that time. So he, he had wrote a worm that would go out and, and look and see if port 80 uh, on your computer, which is the port that gets you to HTTP or um, <clears throat> gives you internet access. Um, would, and it would attach itself, and if port 80 was open, then it would go in and attach itself uh, to your computer. And then it would send information back. And it in the, inadvertently caused millions, millions of dollars of damages and resulted in uh, establishing what we call now our CERT teams. Uh, if you see that in the bottom here, CERT, yeah, that's our U.S. Computer Emergency Readiness Team. And this is, at the, this is at the federal level. And then it breaks out at the state level down to the organizational level with, uh, with the CERT teams. So when you think about it, that's, uh, that's kind of the, the, the background of, of where they come from. Now, when we think about a Trojan, a Trojan is a little bit different, okay, because the Trojan itself is just a, a carrier of uh, malicious code. Um, like I said, and, and the fact that the entire code was written to look like something else. We've all probably experienced uh, Trojans, and, and it was a way of, you know, based on the, Tro the Greeks, you know, Troy, uh, attacking Troy, and they gave him the Trojan horse, the big wooden horse. I'm sure we all know that story. So when we look at worms, as, you know, worms have gotten very sophisticated. Early on, they were not that sophisticated, but now we have worms that are able to, to morph or change themselves. We call them polymorphic worms, and, and what it does is constantly change or morph. Why does it do that, you're asking? You're not asking that question? Uh, if you're not asking, you should have asked that question. Why does it want to do that? Well, here's why. When we think about antivirus, right? Uh, almost uh, most of the antivirus that we use on our home computers um, is signature. We call signature-based antivirus, meaning that there has to be a known virus or a known uh, worm, a malicious uh, code that exists. And the companies like uh, Symantec or McAfee or whoever, they reverse engineer that code of that virus, of that worm, that malicious code, the malware. And then they write a signature that will eradicate that. And they push that signature out to all of us in updates. That's why we constantly get these updates from, you know, antivirus updates, because these are all the new signatures that they know. Well, what this type of polymorphic worm or virus is, is able to do is that as it's going through uh, your network or through your machine, it changes code. So let's say McAvee knew that this existed. They wrote a signature for it and then they see the signature and it updates and you think you're good to go. But as this worm moves through your system, it changes the way it looks every time. So now the signature that worked here doesn't work here or it won't work here. So it, that code continuously changes and more, modifies itself as it moves through your system. Another type of uh, virus is called, we call it the armored, armored viruses, armored ma mal malware. And what this is, is that it is actually encrypted. So the writers of the code actually encrypts it because it makes it much, much harder now for uh, antivirus companies to reverse engineer it. So like I said, you know, quite a, as we get smarter with uh, all of our um, mitigation techniques, guess what happens? The bad guys get smarter with how to write and, and how to circumvent these mitigation techniques. One of the big um, worms that came through about 2002, 2001, 2002 timeframe, was called the SQL, SQL, SQL Slammer Worm. And like I said, this one, and I remember this because it did, it slowed down global internet traffic because it was a, a DOS, a denial of service <laughs> attack. And, and the thing about this one, it, it replicated and it moved so quickly throughout the internet. Over 250,000 hosts were affected within 30 minutes of its release. So if you look at this map over here, like I said, this was, you know, before and in about 19 hours, look how much of the globe had been uh, affected by the slammer. Now, uh, and what the, what the, where the uh, vulnerability was, here again was, and I say almost all of our software, if anybody ever tells you that, you know, well this software, this computing system doesn't have vulnerabilities, don't believe them, it's not true. Okay, 
because it all does. But anyway, this was a, your Microsoft SQL Server. There was a vulnerability. Microsoft had pushed the, they pushed the patch out later uh, to help eradicate that. Okay, when we talk about Trojans, uh, we mentioned that earlier, and I'm sure we've all probably seen, uh, you know, on our computers, you know, these different ads, pop-ups, things like that. Someone trying to get you to click on a link, and also in emails, now, especially now. I say you really have to be careful with your email uh, attachments. Uh, and clicking on links in emails. You want to ensure that uh, that if you have an email that from someone or it's an organization, you're not sure who, who it is, be very careful uh, before you click on any links, any headers, any attachments in that email because you don't know who that could be. So really look at the URL, be sure that it's LinkedIn. Just because the page looks like LinkedIn or the page looks like your financial institution, that, that does not the case because I can stand up and I can uh, replicate the, the front end page of any financial institution, but I, in the background, I may have a completely different URL that's taking you to my nefarious website. And there's so many different types of Trojans. You know, that's just kind of gives you a list of some of the different types of Trojans that have been out there and discovered and, and what they do. All right, next type of attack we talked about was what? Reconnaissance attacks, also known as information gathering. Like I say, it, it's the unauthorized discovery mapping of systems and services. Three different types of uh, reconnaissance attacks we're going to talk about here. Social engineering, uh, internet information, Queries, queries and packet sniffers. So when we think about social engineering, honestly, this is probably one of the greatest one of the, one of the greatest threats that we have now is social engineering. Why? Because it's the human factor. It's the human factor. And that's the fact that we have no control over. That's why in organizations, we spend a lot of money in administrative controls like training, uh, uh, user awareness, general user operation principles, because I can, I can lock down my network with firewalls, with uh, intrusion detection and prevention systems and ADSs and everything else. But if the user clicks on something uh, that's malicious, all of my security is gone. Really, it's just like your home, right? You could go to your home and you could have the best ADS uh, security system. You got cameras, you've got all this stuff, it's motion detectors set up, set up everything else. But what happens if someone rings the doorbell and your 14 year old teenager opens the door and lets them in? All of your security is for naught because they, are authorized now to come into your house. The same thing happens on our networks. So that's why social engineering is such a, a huge threat. Uh, and it's a large vulnerability. And now, different types, like say uh, phishing, I'm sure we're all familiar with phishing, and, but there's different types of phishing. Phishing is uh, like when you may see this where you get the, uh, the emails that are trying to get you to go to some type of uh, nefarious site. We, we see those all the time. And, but then there's this thing we call spear phishing. Spear phishing is when I'm targeting someone or a group within an organization. Um, and so this is why I call it reconnaissance, because before I go to attack, uh, to launch my attack, I'm going to use social engineering to do a lot of my recon, my reconnaissance work. And, and the reason for that is it helps me to reduce my work, uh, my workload if I'm an attacker, because I'm always looking for the easiest target. I am always looking for the, I don't want to spend a lot of time on hard targets. So the way I find those easy targets is through social engineering. I, I want to send, you know, email spams, get those things out there. And hopefully somebody in the organization will click on one of those. And then we have whaling, whaling, I can say, and <clears throat> that's when you go for the big fish. You're going for the guys at the top and you really want to, you know, you, you, it's, it's, it's kind of associated with spear phishing that you're targeting them, but you're targeting, you know, the, the CEO, uh, the CFOs, the, those C staffs and those kinds of people in the organization. And then we have farming. If you haven't heard of farming, well, farming is now where uh, I'm trying to, 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 through social engineering, to drive you to go to a site or just to, to, to get you to go to my website. Uh, where I've got you know malicious code and other things running and smishing, I know where do these terms come from? Smishing, that's when I use texting, um, and then there's vishing where I use voice, voice over IP when I'm sending out and doing social engineering. So just the many things going on like that. Internet information requiries. When we there's tools that you can use on the internet like Who Is or NS Lookup. Those are some tools that that's actually uh, if you ever you know, done use command line on your computer, you know, you can use. Uh, 
uh, NS lookup, name server lookup, and find out and do, do name reversals, meaning that, okay, I've got this IP address or the name of this company, what is their IP address? And also you can find out a lot of other information because if you go to who is, who is will also tell you who the, who the system administrator was, who set up this account and gives you a point of contact, a phone number. So if I've got a company, I do a reverse lookup, I use who is, I may be able to get a phone number out of that to go in and find out at the, to who to contact uh, with reference to that uh, domain um, for that website. So, you know, so there's, there's ways of finding that out, that information right there across the way, across the internet. Another reconnaissance tool that's used a lot. Now this, this was a tool that was built for good. It was, as a matter of fact, if you're not familiar with, with uh, Wireshark, I recommend all of you, cause it's open source, download where Wireshark and become familiar with this, become knowledgeable, uh, become very uh, comfortable with Wireshark because this is a tool that you will use a lot, uh, with, in the, in the network security, cybersecurity, when you're looking at threat of vulnerabilities. It's called a packet sniffer. Like I said, it's just software that runs on your network. It uses the, uh, it takes your, your network card. You have to put it in uh, promiscuous mode. But I know promiscuous mode. Yeah, that means your, your card is not hanging out two or three o'clock in the morning in the clubs. No, that's not what it means. It means that now that your, your network card is able to see all the packets going across uh, the internet, not just, I mean, going across your network, not just the ones that to be routed to you. If you're not in promiscuous mode, you're only going to see the packets that are coming to your, that were destined to your machine. Machine. Promiscuous mode lets you look at everything across um, the uh, collision domain that you're on. But this kind of gives you a snapshot of what um, Wireshark looks like. And really what you can see, uh, it's hard to see it here, but once you upload it, you can look at every packet that's going across your network. And you can also see what protocols, like I said, it gives you like I call individual packet summaries. And then you can drill down into the protocols. And also you can drill down to an individual packet and see what in information is inside of that packet. It's because it's, you may be running um, unsecure protocols like uh, FTP, file transfer protocol, instead of SFTP, which you, we should be running. And if that's the case, you may be passing passwords and other information in the clear. So packet sniffers, so people who use now Wireshark with packet sniffer as a packet sniffer to do bad things because they want to see all the data that's going across your network. Okay, the other type is access attacks. Access attacks. Like I say, now these are the ones that where individuals are now trying to get access to critical information on your network. Uh, they're trying to you know, retrieve data, gain access, or do privilege escalation. If you remember Eric Snowden a while back, uh, he you know, made a lot of, uh, was newsworthy. That's how he was able to get a lot of information from the National Security Agency that he was a contractor that he supported was through privilege escalation. Uh, he moves around the organization, and he kept getting more and more privileges and on the network, and he was able to now get access uh, to information that he should not have had access to. Um, so access attacks, different types we're going to look at these here again, not all inclusive. I just kind of picked four out of the bunch just to, uh, as, a, as a representative sample. We're talking about man in the middle attacks, password attacks, cross site scripting and domain name service tunneling, DNS tunneling. So what is the man in the middle attack? Well, technically the man in the middle attack isn't so much an attack itself. It's just a way of positioning yourself in the network. So now that you can launch an attack. So we look at a man in the middle. Let's say, let, let's look at these two, uh, um, um, computer devices that have been communicating. This is you, and let's say this is your bank, and you've just had a session going on with you and your bank. Well, what the man in the middle wants to be able to do is have that path broken and then inject themselves in the middle. So now all the communications that's going to your bank goes through that individual, and he's using a tool like Wireshark to look at all the packets and to, to scrub all the data. So he's, he's getting all your information uh, in, in this man in the middle attack. And, and you know, so that's what we're showing here, man in the middle. So one of the things that happens once you know, you, you get in the middle, you can do a lot of different things. For example, here's just one example, something we call replay attacks. So let's say you have a session here again, you know, you, 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 go, you, you logged into your bank at 10 o'clock in the morning. And it, you know, when you hit your, the server uh, for your bank, the access server, um, you, you have to give them your, you know, you have to log in, you know, with all the information you need to log in. Well, guess what this man in the middle is doing? He is recording that session. He's recording all that information. And what he's gonna do now, come back later on, let's say at one o'clock in the afternoon, he's gonna replay that back to your bank and if their security isn't up excuse me up to date 
this bank will think that, oh, this is you because everything looked the same. Your username, password, and it could even be encrypted, you know, um, and it was still depending on how the configuration of this, of the uh, distant end server, it still may look at that because the cookies and everything, all those other things have been recorded. Now, I will tell you, this doesn't work as well today because most of your backend systems, backend servers, they timestamp uh, these sessions. Meaning that a session that ran at 10 o'clock, if it tried to run again at one o'clock, this would know it and know that it's an illegitimate session and not uh, connect and not, not let you log on. But that's just an example of what that man in the middle will try to do many times. <clears throat> Password uh, attacks. Many, many, you know, passwords, we're still, as a, as a, Society, we're very lax with passwords. And really, this is probably one of our first layers of defense that we, or second layers of defense that we should always look at is, is good passwords. Because cracking passwords is, is it's going to become very, very easy now. Uh, there are software tools out there. Like I said, the one you see here, this is just an example of, of Lothcrack that you know, basically takes a hash of passwords and generate plain text passwords from them. And what that means is that when you, when you create a password, that password that you created isn't physically sitting on the on the server. It's a hash, or it's a there's a numerical representation of that. That's what's sitting on the on the server. So when you type in your password, it rehashes it or re-encrypts it. It's a type of one-way encryption, and it should match word uh, letter for letter, character for character of what's on the of what's sitting on the server. If it doesn't, you get it. You, you won't be logged in. Uh, but so this is what this does. It, it's able to take those hashes and, and generate the plain text password back from two, div, two typical, two um, kind of types of uh, password or brute, uh, uh, methods. One is what we call dictionary cracking. Dictionary cracking is that where it looks at every word that's in a dictionary and tries to, to, to match it up and, and does um, computations with a dictionary to see if it can figure out what the password is. The other one is what we call brute force. That's where it tries to use every possible combination. So let's say you have a, a eight digit password. It's gonna try to use every feasible combination. Now, as technology gets improved, as memory is better, as, as computer speeds are getting faster, it is getting easier and easier for computers now to generate brute force. Before, it would take them forever, you know, years, hundreds of years. This time is getting shorter and shorter. If we ever get to the place where quantum computing uh, becomes a reality, a day-to-day a, a -day reality, the way we do passwords, the way we do encryption is completely broken because a quantum computer will be able to go through and generate every permutation of these large, large numbers in a relatively short amount of time. So more work to be done there, but don't let that scare you. Man, when we think about password attacks, like I said, there's, there's all types of tools. John the Ripper, Rainbow Crag, WFuzz, Kane Enable, Medusa. I mean, there's all these different tools. And most of these, I mean, for you can download these, believe it or not, right off the internet, and go out and start playing around trying to crack people's passwords or crack passwords on your own. You may say, well, why, did, why was these invented? Well, the reason some of these were invented was we would have uh, nefarious activity on, on compute, on systems, and we would need to get into somebody's account. Uh, because we didn't trust what they were doing. And so we need a way as, as the good guys, as the whitehead guys, to get into their account. So that's where these tools were originally written for. Well, you know, it didn't take long for someone to figure out, hmm, I can take a tool meant for good and use it for bad. Okay, denial of service attacks. Like I say, this is, this is one that's, uh, you know, probably one of the, the most difficult to completely eliminate because DDoS, DOS or DDoS attacks they're, they're, they're pretty easy to execute. Um, three different types we'll talk about, ping of death, smurf, and T, uh, TCP uh, send flood attacks. But there's a host of other, other attacks. And like I say, with a denial of service, I'm trying to keep you from being able to get to the service or the information that you need. Now, typically what you're going to see isn't a DOS. It's going to be a distributed DOS attack. Why? Because to now to be able to shut down a, a network, a uh, server, that because we have so much memory, I'm going to need a lot of, of pings, a lot of inputs. So how does, how does this work? Well, what do we got? We have an attacker, right? Um, and that attacker usually has some type of uh, command and control, a CNC server. <laughs> Excuse me. And that CNC server and, uh, it controls a lot of computers. Because many of your home computers, probably right now, you may have a bot, what we call a bot. Um, is a small piece of code that 
some attacker may have put on your computer, you would never know it. It's sitting there running in the background, but whenever they need to use some processing power, they're able to access your computer, access that bot, and now use your computer to do some type of nefarious activities. As a matter of fact, if you think about the internet of things, you look around your house, think of all the things that's connected to the internet. Like probably, some of you guys probably have those new Gucci refrigerators that's uh, internet connected. You know, they've got the, the camera and the door and all that. But your Roku devices, uh, smart TVs, washers, dryers, ovens. I mean, now everything is being connected. Well, guess what? All of these devices now, if we're not careful, they can be accessed and be used in a, in a botnet. So all of these are here may not be just regular computers like we're thinking about. These could all be different types of networking devices that are connected to our network that now someone has a command and control server. That, so, so yeah, so your Roku device or your smart TV could actually be passing spam messages and you would never know it. It's being used uh, to pass that type of traffic. So what happens now? So now that I've got multiple computers that's trying to send, let's say a, a ping or spam, to this one server. It's gonna take it, it, just, it won't take quite as long for this guy right here to kill over and die. Uh, because now I have hundreds, thousands uh, of computers that are sending information, that are sending pings, or that are sending spam, that are sending other types of, uh, who could be a nefarious data to that one. So now it makes it much easier to crash that server. Hope that makes sense. Another type of attack, and this is similar, but uh, it's a smurf attack. Now, this is like a, a misdirected attack. Like I say, what it does, it takes a, a large amount of, usually ping, some type of ICMP package, like a ping, uh, with the intent of spoof, uh, uh, with, the intended, with the intended victim's spoofed source IP address, where it's broadcast. So basically, what happens, this guy right here, the bad guy, the bad guy over here in the corner, okay, he sends a ping, to this, we call this amplifying network. But, but instead of having his IP address, he's got the IP address of the victim or the target that he wants to hit. Because typically what would happen if I would normally, if I would send a ping to here, well, this server is gonna send it right back to him because that's how IP kind of works. Is that, okay, I know the, 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 uh, the source address this came from and I'm gonna send it back. Well, what this guy does, instead of using his own IP address, he spoofs this guy's address. So 172.18.1.2, so now he may be at 172.21.1.7, doesn't matter. But when he sends this, this guy now is gonna send it back to where? Yes, 172.18.1.2. But what he's gonna do first is gonna go, it's gonna be sent to all of these computers. Now all of these computers are gonna respond back to, you got it, 172.18.1.2. They're not gonna come back to him. So that's how we do a Smurf attack. One guy hits it here, goes here, and sends it to the victim. And what this does is helps to mask or conceal this guy because, and now when we start doing forensics and we start looking at, okay, how did this happen? All the, the IP address we're gonna see is just the victims. Smurf attacks. Ping of death. This is one, you know, this is one of the early, early attacks. Uh, you don't really see this as much because most of our software and our operating systems, they're smart enough to know uh, this, this attack. But it was called a ping of death because when you look at a ping package, uh, a ping, uh, the maximum size that it can be is 65,535. But what this ping, of, what this bad guy would do, he would build a ping package that was bigger than that, huge, and send it to the victim. Well, the victim's computer gets this ping package that's bigger than the size that it's supposed to be, doesn't know what to do with it, you know, and it just goes into a buffer overflow and crashes. Boom. They're dead in the water. So we look at some different types of attack vectors, right? Access attacks, end user attacks, reconnaissance, uh, as well as now we're looking at different types of uh, DDoS attacks. The, the last one we're going to talk about is a send flood attack. This is an interesting one. Uh, if you are familiar with, with the internet and IP, there's this thing we call handshakes. For instance, every time your computer you, uh, with TCP, with transmission control protocol, every time it wants to go out to the internet, for instance, and talk to uh, a server on the internet, well, it does a handshake. First thing it does is it sends a, a send package. And then the 
uh, computer at the other end goes, okay, I got to send package from this IP address. And it sends back a SENAC package. Then your computer receives a SENAC and it normally sends back an ACK. I mean, that's what we call a handshake. So that way, those two computers, they validate that they're able to talk to each other. Now, what this type of uh, flood attack does, uh, the, 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 the bad guy here, he's pretty interesting because now what he does, he uh, forges a, uh, the, the sending address, meaning that he, he makes up a fake address. So now when he sends a send package, the send act doesn't come back to him. The send act goes to this forged package, this forged IP address that may not even exist. And if it doesn't exist, guess what? It never gets the act back. So every time he sends, and, and every time he does this, this, this computer now is sitting there with an open channel, an open access request, or a half open uh, connection. It's waiting. It's sitting in wait mode. I'm waiting for the, come on, come on, give me the SENAC back. Uh, give me the ACK back, I'm sorry, because he sent the SENAC. Give me the ACK back, and it's just, uh, but it's going out here to nowhere, out here in the ether. So every time this guy sends one, this one uses up another channel, uses up another channel, and just sitting there. Now, let's say this guy now uses the DDoS method we just talked about, where he's got a botnet. So now you got a botnet, you got thousands of computers sending send requests to this guy. And he's got, now he's sending thousands of send acts that aren't going anywhere. So over time, as you see, it doesn't take long before buffer overflows, he runs out of memory. And now somebody who wants to actually get to a resource is unable to get there because this server is set there going, it's, it's um, over, in overflow mode. Not, 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 nothing's going on. So that's what we call a send flood request, a, a attack. Pretty interesting? Yeah, I think so. Okay, last one we're gonna talk about is cross-site scripting. And this is really from you know, on, the, on, the, on the web and uh, uh, uses, using things like a lot of times Java, JavaScript, uh, <clears throat> client-side or server-side uh, scripting languages. Two types of attacks. One is what we call a stored attack. Okay, let me walk you through this. All right, so here's the hacker, right? And let's say you, you okay, back up a little bit. Like me, I have a website, I have a web page. I have a web page, okay? So what this hacker will try to do, especially if I, if I don't have my web page secured properly, he will inject some script on my web page. And that script may be sitting in a in an iframe or in a in, in a in a field um, on, where I would never see it. Or you would never see it. Okay, so now I got this 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 nefarious script, this malicious code sitting on my website. Don't know it. Well, then here's the visitor, Mr. Visitor. He goes to, to my website because he wants to see some stuff on my site. But what happens is that while he's there, uh, and, and so let's say he wants to subscribe. I've got a, let's say I have a, a box in there where you can subscribe and you can put in your name and all the information subscribe to my site. Well, that's where this hacker, that's where he put the, 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 the code is in that, in that box. Now, so when the visitor subscribes, he picks up that malware. And so now the next time they go out to the internet, he pushed, he takes that infected script with them out to the rest of the internet. So it's a script that's being run across websites. And now, likewise, when I start doing the, the forensics, looking back, it looked like it came from my site. It's hard to track it back to this guy because it looks like I'm the one who generated that bad code. Uh, the other type is we call re reflected, non-persistent. In this mode, that code sits on my website. In this mode right here, it's, it doesn't sit there. It's non-persistent. Like I say, what the, what the uh, attacker does, he puts the HTML code, HTML code within a link to a website. So now he just wants the, uh, the user, uh, <clears throat> the victim, to click on that link that will take them to a server, picks up the bad code, and then pushes it back out. And at the same time, it comes back to him, and he's able to get all the uh, users the victim's information. Cross-site scripting. All right, DNS tunneling. I'm not sure if you're familiar with DNS, the domain name service. Well, that is really what makes our internet work the way that we are used to it working, is DNS, domain name service. Uh, that's why we can you know, type in Google, or we can type Amazon, or we can type in uh, getlministry.com, and it, it takes us to the website. 
because if you think of the internet, it doesn't understand the names. It, doesn't, it, it understands IP addresses. Well, you know, 172.15.12.1. So DNS is what converts IP addresses to uh, names. And it will also, we can do reverse lookups or it will convert a name back to an IP address. So for instance, you know, I use this as, as an example. You want to go out to the uh, uh, California Baptist website, right? CBU, the uh, calbaptist.edu. Well, you, you, know, you, you typed it into your search engine, but trust me, your search engine don't have a clue what that is. The DNS protocol that's running behind that, it goes out to a DNS server and it goes out to actually multiple DNS servers and it looks up that name. It's almost like a phone book and it looks up that name. And then on that name, just like if you remember the old phone books, you can look up a name, then you can find the address, you know. Well, it looks up that name and it says, oh, okay, calbaptist.edu. Well, its IP address is 209.77.48.6 and it sends that back to your computer. And that's what actually goes out across the internet and now makes the connection, not Cal. Baptist, all calbaptist.edu that you typed in, it just went to a DNS server that then um, recovered the actual IP address. So with that being said, and when they when they made this protocol, they never imagined in their wildest dreams, probably back in the, I think, 90s, uh, when we start using DNS, that anyone would ever use it for nefarious purposes, for malicious reasons. But when you look at this protocol, it's made up of, of records. And within each of these records that make up this protocol, there are, there are fields that aren't used. Like in most of our protocols, if you actually look into the real protocols, there's areas that's unused because they, they built in expansion space so in case they want to add things later on. So, but, so with bad guys, and, and think with D DNS, it travels over the internet all the time. Go back to my example. Think about how many times people are searching. So DNS is moving back and forth across the internet constantly. And most people don't even pay attention to it. Most companies, most organizations, you don't think about DNS. Okay, you know, DNS is going, even if you're looking at Wireshark, you know, if you look at uh, port 53, the, 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 the runs DNS. You'll see it constantly going. Well, what the bad guys figured out that, you know, and since nobody's looking at it, I can use DNX for exfiltration, data exfiltration. And what do I mean by that? Okay. Let's say that, let's take this into natural. All right. Let's say I'm able to break into Fort Knox. Okay. I did it. I figured out how to break into Fort Knox. Yeah. Fort Knox is where they keep all this gold. All right. But there's one problem that I have. Even after I break in, I gotta figure out how, how to get the gold out. How do you get the gold out after you, you got tons, mega tons of this stuff. How do you get it out? Well, it's the same way uh, on, on, in, in, in cyber, in the cyber world, is we have um, a problem. People, could, they, I may break into your network, I may be there. But now how do I get this data out? I mean, I've hit a database, it's got all these credit card numbers and I'm trying to get these credit cards out, numbers out. How do I do it? Well, this is how. They will take uh, those credit card numbers and they'll usually encrypt them or they'll uh, do some type of optication of it. And little by little, they'll just stick them inside of a DNS message uh, record. And that's how they can leak data out and the defenses doesn't see it. Because normally, if uh, most networks today, the way they're built, they, we, we were monitoring networks, and if there is a huge change in traffic going across the network, you know, it's gonna light up like a Christmas tree. We're gonna see it, you know, all, all of our our, um, uh, our monitoring devices, it's gonna say, oh man, what is, why is all of a sudden we got all this data moving? Well, this way, it just trickles out a little at a time through DNS, and nobody is watching it. Nobody is watching it. It reminds me of a joke that my dad used to tell all the time. He's like, there's this young kid in Mexico, and he would always, every day, bring a wheelbarrow full of dirt up to the customs uh, gate to, to, to go into the United States. And they knew he was stealing something. Every day, he'd come with a wheelbarrow full of dirt, and they'd make him dump the dirt out, and they'd go through the dirt. They couldn't find anything, so he'd shovel it back in and keep going. Next day, he comes up, and this went on for like a month. And, and, the, and the customs people were just like, what is going on here? Because we know something's going on. Finally, they asked him, said, what are you doing? What are you stealing? He said, oh, wheelbarrows. Yeah, I'm stealing wheelbarrows. But they were looking at the dirt. And every day, he'd steal another wheelbarrow. So DNS kind of works that way, is that, a lot of times we're not looking at the, at the DNS because it's a wheelbarrow, you know, and we're just rolling things out with it. Okay, so now let's go to the attack kill chain. Attack kill chain. 
All right, so when we think about the attack kill chain, let's think about attackers first, right? And so there's different categories of what we call malicious threat actors. Um, and, and they vary in, in, in um, skills, they vary in many things. At the top, start, you may have heard this term called script kitties. Well, you know, if you go out to the internet now, you can find pre-built scripts, there's websites that have scripts already written. All you have to do is pull them out, make a couple changes, put into your own IP addresses that you need, and you can run that exploit yourself. You don't have to be a, a sharp script writer and know all this stuff. That's what we call script kitties. These, actually, these are very kind of low tech, um, don't have a lot of expertise, and uh, actually, that, that actually goes out and run hacking campaigns using scripts that are already, built, already developed. Now, next layer we have what we call hacktivists. Now, what a hacktivist is, these are many times people who have a, a, an agenda, a, a political agenda, you know, and, and they're usually more skilled than, than your script kitties. Uh, you may have heard some of these groups like Anonymous or, you know, Lose Sec, you know, Lose Security, that's what it came from, Lose Sec. And what they do, you know, for political reasons, they, they launch and they deface, you know, companies' websites and, and they, you know, do DDoS attacks on, on companies, not so much for money most of the time, but really, like I say, it's for politics. Now, as we move down the stack, you know, we get to these guys, what we call state-sponsored actors. And what these are, where we have countries now who will go to, um, uh, they, will, they will sponsor themselves attackers. And these are highly skilled individuals. And these are the ones, you know, it's kind of like when we talk about cyber crime, cyber warfare, um, who are actually now trying to attack infrastructure, SCADA systems, uh, critical infrastructure. Um, and we also have another category in there also we call cyber criminals. Cyber criminals are similar, you know, to hacktivists or, or state-sponsored actors in the fact that they are very skilled, but they're, they are after the money. Show me the money. That's their job, is that they're looking to, to exfiltrate um, as much um, currency, whether it's credit card numbers, whether it's Bitcoin, whatever it may be, they're you know, trying to generate that. And the last type, believe it or not, is probably one of the most dangerous, insider threats. If you talk to any cyber uh, analysts uh, within the industry today, they will tell you that where a lot of our attention go is to trying to combat insider threat. Why? Because if you're already, if you're inside, if you are inside of the network already, you have access, you've got permissions, you've got all these things. So it makes it much harder now to, to track and you really have to do a lot of auditing to, to look at the movements of people within the network uh, to be sure that, that they're not exfiltrating uh, company intellectual property, uh, things of that nature outside of the, the organization. So now, how do these uh, attackers go about their their business? This is the what we call the attacker kill chain, and it's very similar to what we used to do in the military. Like, so I'm retired Air Force, and you know, when we would uh, have missions, especially when I was like in Saudi Arabia, you know, doing Desert Storm, you know, there was a process that we, we went about. So it's very similar. It starts off what we call reconnaissance. You know, we talked about some reconnaissance attacks earlier. Well, the bad guys do that. They try to gather as much information about the network, about potential targets. You know, who's going to be the best target? You know, before we can prosecute it, a target. Now, once they figure the target out, they go into the weaponization phase. Weaponization, like I said, that's where now let's let's start putting together what type of cyber weapon that will marry up with the, uh, based on the recon that we got. Is it gonna be a virus? Is it gonna be a worm? Do I do a phishing attack? And, you know, and we look across those, they look across those. Then once we got a weapon, I gotta be able to deliver that. You know, unlike we did in the Air Force, you know, we just strapped you know, a couple of heat seekers on some F-16s and F-15s and F-22s and go for it, no. They're looking at things like email attachments or phishing uh, emails, uh, USB ports, all, USB drives, all those kind of things, uh, how they can get this weapon, this, this software into the network. All right, and then once it's in, you gotta be able to do exploitation. That's where you're looking for weaknesses, weaknesses in applications, weaknesses in operating systems, or users. You know, that's where user training comes in, so, because now they're looking for that untrained user who will click on that Trojan that they just sent out. So you got to figure out how to exploit and do the exploitation. Also, that's why we do hardening, operation, operate, uh, operating system hardening, uh, application hardening, where we shut off as many ports, we shut off services that are not used. Uh, installation, okay, we, we, we look for a way in, now we got to ins actually install it. You know, that's where now this install, I, I, as a bad guy, I want to be sure that I got some type of back door into that system so that now I can still be able to do control of that uh, exploit. So CNC, like I said, that's, now that I've installed it, 
now that code is ready to start beaconing back. Say, okay, I'm installed. Now it's trying to reach back to uh, the server, the, the, to the, the hacker server. So I've got it, like I said, I've got it installed. Now I got command control. Now it's time to do what we call actions on objectives. You know, what we call warheads on foreheads, bombs on target. And so now I'm ready to actually do the, 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 the dirty work of trying to exfiltrate uh, intellectual property, whatever it may be, data thieves, um, bandwidth theft, whatever it may be. That's now I've done that. But the, we go through those steps. So if you look at the bottom down here, we kind of lay this out, you know, you get you help in phases where you got a t the targeting phase. That's where you, you recon, your staging or weaponization. And then we actually go into the compromise phase. That's where now we're going to launch, do the exploit, install, and this is where the data breach actually happens. Now, there's something called APT, Advanced Persistent Threats. This may take years, you know, especially with um, nation state actors that we talked about on the last slide that once they get here, because you don't want to move too quickly, you start moving too quickly, then someone's going to notice that there's something, there's activity, malicious activity. So that, that piece of code may sit here for six months, a year, before we actually go here. And, and the breach may be so small and so slow that we're just uh, exfiltrating little bits of data out at a time. So it's advanced persistent threats, that's what we talked about there. And now, this is what we call exploit kits, because back here, doing that exploit stage, right here, exploits, this is how that process so many times works with the exploit kit. So if we kind of walk through this, right? Um, and one of the things that, they, that when they launch a kit is many times it's done on, you know, across the web, across the internet, um, on a compromised website, because people aren't doing uh, their, their cybersecurity due diligence on their websites. So, you know, or you could be a malicious ad. Let's say so. So, so you get you get the victim browsing, and you uh, on, on, a, on a malicious website. User visits the site, and and let's say that there's malicious advertisement. Somebody has put an iframe on a website that has malicious advertisement. Somebody and the individual clicks on it. So now they get redirected. When you click on that, you get redirected to the malicious advertisement site that takes you to the compromised website. Now. You, and, and in this process, you may get redirected multiple times. That redirect process may happen, may happen multiple times. So from there, like I say, in step three, um, you end up with what they call the landing page. And that is the bad guy's website. And that's where once the, the, the innocent, honest person is gotten stuck on this landing page, that's where they pick up the bad virus. That's where they pick up the, uh, the exploit. And from there, that exploit now gets into my browser, and so now I'm able to push that across you know, the uh, victim's machine. So that's how an exploit kit kind of goes together so that we can do the exploitation once we get access into your network. So how do we mitigate these? And we think about from a cyber perspective, if I look at each of these categories, so at the recon stage, right? At that first stage, well, things like firewalls and intrusion detections uh, systems, that's where you wanna be sure those types of cybersecurity tools are up and working, that you got good firewalls, or even with what we call next generation firewalls that are even much, much, much smarter, and looking at people who are trying to do, you know, like packet sniffers, that you wanna instantly see that somebody has, is out there pinging every port on your network, that you can block that down, or somebody's trying to run this tool called, we call NMAP, that is trying, they're trying to um, enumerate your network and see what ports you have open. So that, that, that's how we try to stop it here. In the, in the staging area, really, uh, you know, that really comes down to threat intel. What do we mean by threat intel? Uh, that's when you're able to actually start looking at um, other type of attacks that have happened in other industry, other parts of, of the network. And if you go out to the internet, there are websites, you know, out there, the search site, um, different websites that has a, a OWASP that have all of these um, different threats and different uh, vulnerabilities and things that are, have, have been already tracked and found. So you want to always stay up to date on the, with the latest intel. Now, at that launch phase, how are you going to protect, protect that? Well, you, that's when you really want to have DNS security, what they call DN, DNSSEC, uh, or email security, or web security, all of these different types of securities that you want to have in place, that you're running HTTPS, that your email is, is, is secured with some type of um, uh, uh, security, uh, uh, encryption. 
because that's how that, that they're going to typically launch that is through one of these means, because these things is what's going to get you outside of your network. Either you're going to have DNS going in and out of your network, emails are constantly transversing in and out of your network, or people connecting to your website. So that's how that gets in. But let's say it's gotten in, and actually they're going into the exploit stage, and really that's where your malware uh, comes in, your, your antivirus and all those tools on your network, network side, network side and antivirus. Um, now, typically that's going to try to install because you want to you want to block it on the network before it gets to your host, before it gets to your client computers. But if it doesn't, you still want to be sure that you've got host uh, or client computer uh, antivirus software running so that you can stop it there uh, at that level at the, with the host. Just in case it gets through and it's still there. Now, when it tries to call back. You know, at that CNC, it's trying to reach back to its home computer. You still, here again, that's where your DNS security and your web security is going to try to block it from going back out. So even if I couldn't block it from coming in, I want to try to block it from getting out. Um, and then in that persistent stage, if it's made it that far, um, the way you're going to notice it, the way you're going to analyze it is with analytic tools and with monitoring tools, things like uh, like Splunk and different things that you're able to look across your, your network or solar winds on the, on, the, on the networking side. So you can watch activity and you're able to baseline your network so you can see um, when, when, when changes happen uh, along the way. So that's how we actually want to utilize that, uh, the, how to mitigate the, uh, the attacker kill chain. Hope that made sense. I know, I know, that's a lot of information we're putting out here today, a lot, but that's why we video it so you can go back and watch it again and again and again and again. All right, we're gonna end up here on domains and certifications. You remember, I think it was week one, I, I made the analogy of IT and cybersecurity, right? You know. IT is kind of like the plumber, whereas cybersecurity is kind of like your water inspector. That plumber, they be sure the, they want to ensure the pipes are together, but they, they're not as concerned about the quality of the water going through the pipe as the city water inspector. Well, cybersecurity, we're concerned about all of those, but especially about the information and that we're protecting the information. And because of that, that's how the, 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 the uh, industry, the career is set up around domains. Uh, actually, these are really, actually, I, I took from my uh, CISSP, Cert, um, but if you go to almost any of the others, there are similar domains that are set up. Uh, right now, they use eight domains uh, for everything from a identity and access management, uh, security assessment and training, security operations, software development. Uh, now, this is your networking piece, communication and network security, software uh, security engineering. How do you engineer cyber in? Because, you know, like we always do, we try to say in, in, in the industry is that uh, cyber is something you want to bake in, not strap on, meaning that you want to start thinking about cyber right at the beginning, at the engineering phase uh, of, of new products, of new software that you that you engineered in. All too long, we've been strapping it on. I mean, we make a product, and then we send it to the security guys, okay, make it secure. But usually by the time it's too late, if, especially if I got to go back and make massive changes to code and things like that. Uh, asset security and risk management. So we think about those domains. You see, that's a broad, that's very broad. That covers a lot of real estate. And so because of that, you, you, you see we have, you know, there's a lot, and this isn't all, this is just kind of a a, um, a short look at, at some of the different positions uh, within the cybersecurity prof uh, uh, profession, where you've got network security engineers. Uh, and what they do here again we, we, is here how you engineer security in as you are building out your network. Um, information security analysts, like I say, well, those are the ones that are looking at yeah, maybe at a, at a SOC, at a security operations center, where you could be a tier one analyst or a tier two, tier three analyst, and you're watching real time events. Uh, security specialists, like I say, same thing. A lot of times they're working uh, a lot of your uh, accreditation packages and things of that nature because um, there's a lot of paperwork that goes along with that or, or the risk management framework of being sure that all your security controls uh, are in place and things of that nature. Uh, security administrators, like I said, they're the ones who do a lot of times the day-to-day -day network security administration of, of building uh, ACLs and, and, and set, establishing permissions and, and privileges. Uh, network security architect, like I said, that's pretty high level. Now you're looking across not just uh, individual domain but across your industry across your business at the kind of at the business level of understanding how do I need to architect not just engineer like say this is the guy that's kind of doing the nuts and bolts but how do I need to architect my my network my domain so it's still meeting my customers requirements you know they pretty much kind of in, uh, touch base a lot with 
uh, the, the C staff, so that well, here's where the organization is going. So now do we start moving to cloud, start making those decisions? Uh, do we start outsourcing things? Well, now how do I build security into this architecture? And then same with security engineers, uh, systems engineers, because not only do we want to be sure the network's secure, but all this, look at it, look at it holistically uh, from a top down, from a systems view. And also, and we're going to finish up here on this slide, I think it's the last one, there's just a plethora of certifications and organizations that provide certifications whether it's SANS, you know, ISICA, Cisco has quite a few certifications that are very good. Many of you, when you first start out in the industry, you're probably going to start with a Security Plus. You're going to go to CompTIA. CompTIA, TIA, they sponsor the Security Plus because a lot of the organizations now, especially if you plan on working with the DOD or some federal agent agency, will require that you have as a minimum of a, a Security Plus certification before you can have any type of privileged user access to their network. You can be a general user, you know, but before you can have any type of privileged user like a system administrator or holding any of those positions, you're going to have that. Certified ethical hackers, uh, CEHs, yeah, I, think, I know that some of you guys are probably inter interested in that. And if you do, I tell you, <clears throat> I highly recommend that you download, I don't know if you're not familiar with Linux or not, if you haven't had experience with Linux, but if you're looking at doing anything like certified ethical hacking or uh, digital forensics, any of these, uh, that you really have to, you know, I would say download Kali Linux, K-A-L-I, Kali Linux. That is a Linux distribution that has all of your uh, certified, CE8, certified ethical hacking uh, tools, tool sets built into it. So, you know, you're going to get the password crackers, you're going to get exploit kits, um, you know, Metasploit. There's many, many tools that's built into Kali Linux. Highly recommend if you're going to look at trying to do this cybersecurity path that you become proficient, fluent and uh, with Kali because that's kind of an industry standard. If you, there's other, so many other areas. For instance, uh, I know some of you guys are interested in the medical background. Uh, well, within the realm of, of, of the medical world, there's a healthcare information system and privacy practitioner because there's so much that goes along with HIPAA and all the associated securities associated with, with, the, with the medical industry, yeah, it has its own set of certifications uh, that you can press out toward. Another growing area is a certified wireless security professional. Because uh, now if you look at how much wireless we've got going in and out, you know, bring your own uh, device type of things in our organizations. So now becoming proficient as a wireless security professional is another growth path. All right. We covered a lot of ground today, didn't we? Whew. A lot of information, I know, I know. But I just uh, want to be sure that I know that, that, that uh, we're able just to share some of this, some of my experiences and things that I've uh, worked with over the last few years. And hopefully it'll help you all, help you make decisions, especially if you've been interested in going uh, the cybersecurity route. All right, God bless you. If you have any questions, as I always say, be sure to, you know, to email or, or shoot me a text, whatever you need. Hope you enjoyed this. Have a blessed week.